Today's speaker is Greg Horowitz, uh, co-founder and managing director of T2 Venture Creation, which is an early stage venture fund. Uh, Greg is a Kaufman Fellow. He's also a fellow at the Center for Design Research at Stanford, doing some really interesting stuff with Larry Leifer. Um, he's also co-founder of Global Connect, which is a think tank based in, uh, at UCSD that really focuses on the development and growth of innovation clusters or networks of innovation, which is also the topic of his book uh, called The Rainforest, The Secret to Building the Next Silicon Valley, uh, which he co-authored with Victor Wong in 2012. Um, and Greg has advised and mentored and consulted for a really interesting list of organizations. And I won't have time to mention all of those now, but one of them I wanted to quickly mention was that he was kind of managing uh, president or a managing consultant for uh, under Warren Buffett at Berkway Hathaway, Berkshire Hathaway, which I think is pretty interesting. Um, anyway, let's give Greg. A oh, thank you. thank you. Thank you. Thanks. This is one of my favorite things to do. Now, this particular presentation is um, an abbreviated version of one that we're going to be doing this weekend um, in um, uh, Marrakesh at the COP22, basically on the future of smart cities and uh, what we're doing with them. But it has a lot of the elements um, of my work and kind of what we do. So I'm kind of an unusual uh, entrepreneur slash academic slash intellect. So what a lot of people used to call a renaissance person. But um, if you understand kind of my background, you'll probably understand a little bit more about kind of why I do what I do in the first place. So I did graduate from UCSD a long time ago. Um, and I graduated with degrees in biochemistry, music, and economics. So that was not because I wanted to be this particularly well-rounded person. It was truly because my parents wanted me to become a doctor and I wanted to become a musician. And I also figured that music would serve me well regardless of what I did, um, because our business would, because uh, business is always a good fundamental to understand. So it was after college that I actually traveled around the world, uh, took a little bit of time off. I ended up spending time in Japan of all places uh, and was fascinated with this model of Kiretsu and just in time. Uh, there was a very famous book called The Art of Japanese Management. And it was all around you know, process optimization. And I was fascinated with that, brought that, ended up bringing that back uh, uh, with me, some of those ideas. And we ended up instilling it in a family business that we ended up growing quite well. And um, that was kind of my first foray into business. Then went to work uh, for, um, then ended up going to work for Berkshire Hathaway for one of the operating subsidiaries. And those kinds of businesses were quite interesting. So how many of you have heard of Berkshire Hathaway? Okay, wonderful. So for those of you who haven't, uh, probably one of the best known investors in the United States is a gentleman named Warren Buffett. And he seems to have a very keen sense for investing uh, in companies uh, that have a lot of latent potential. Um, that are able to do things and do things quite well. And as a manager of a business, he wants people with really good pattern recognition. People who don't make very many uh, mistakes and are able to walk in to the business and see what's wrong with it and fix it. Because the purpose of these businesses is all around what they call cash efficiency. It's not about really how much money you make. It's about how efficient you are at making that money. So I worked there for a number of years uh, uh, in an executive capacity. But our model was very much predict and repeat. Raw goods came in the back door. We added value to them. We pushed them out the front door. And it was quite linear in nature. In fact, as long as we knew who our suppliers were and who our customers were, the rest of the world kind of didn't matter uh, because it was a very focused, very precise process. We always knew exactly what the outcomes were. And our job was to make as few mistakes as possible in doing that. Um, but I began getting bored. And one of my mentors there knew I was getting bored. And he had funded and put some money into a company in the Silicon Valley. And that was pretty exciting to me in the 90s because I felt like the kid pressing his face up against the candy store window, seeing what could possibly be and not being able to touch it. And here I was given an opportunity to work in a Silicon Valley startup. And it was very exciting. It was a very, uh, it was a wild ride going up. And it was also quite scary because you almost felt like you had to suspend all the rules and all the knowledge you had learned before for this new paradigm. People were saying that the rules of engagement uh, in the Silicon Valley 
were completely different than the traditional rules of business. And I had been trained on this old model, and so I kind of felt like I didn't know what I was doing. Because employees would come in for a job interview, and they wouldn't ask you what job they were going to do. They wanted to know how many options they were getting and how quickly they were going to vest, and at what price they were going to invest. And because there was relatively negative unemployment in the late 90s in the Silicon Valley, they could often feel like they could hold you hostage. They could come to you and say, well, if you don't like what I'm doing, fine. I'll walk out the door, and within 15 minutes, I'll have another job but you will be scrambling to try to fill the gap uh, that we've got. So I made every mistake you can make, and yet we still got lucky because we were able to ride that up. We were able to exit the company uh, well. And the, whoever tells you a story of success, uh, particularly in the Silicon Valley, and doesn't use the word luck at least once in their story, is probably lying about what they're doing. So I was fortunate to have some luck. But as Mr. Buffett always said, it's always better to be lucky than smart. You just have to know the difference. So I knew the difference. And I was then given a job or given an opportunity to be an entrepreneur in residence for a venture fund in the Valley. In fact, it was one of the venture funds that had invested in my company. What that meant is they gave me a desk, a checkbook, and a hunting license. And they said, go out and go hunt and kill your next prey. And that's when I had one of my first big epiphanies about the whole entrepreneurial ecosystem. There are hunters and there are farmers. There are people who are naturally curious and go and seek opportunity and see the world rather than a bunch of problems. They see things as opportunities in them. And I am that person. A friend of mine was starting a company at the time. We invested in that company and we did well. The company went public and it then gave me uh, the power of choice and option. So there's a professor at Stanford University, Audrey McLean, who says power is all about having options. And so for the first time in my life, I had options. I then took some time off, came back to San Diego, uh, where I had gone to school, and was deciding what to do next. Began volunteering with a program here called Connect. Uh, Connect was a local business accelerator at the time, focused on growing and supporting local indigenous companies in San Diego. I thought it was a wonderful opportunity to volunteer because I could see interesting startups. And if I found the next startup I wanted to jump into, I could grab them. Uh, during that time, uh, the, the director of the program had left. And I was asked to step in as the interim director of the program. Um, and my only mandate was, don't let it die. Keep it going and see if we can get it back on its feet. And so I learned a lot of lessons during that time. And I wrote a white paper during that period. And it was all about what the future of business accelerators and incubators would look like. And I said there was a fundamental shift going on in the world uh, that was changing the way we perceive the world. And I'll talk a little bit about that here. And when I went around to some of the key thought leaders in the community and described this new model of globalization that we were becoming highly interconnected and highly, um, uh, that we were connected by our humanity and our empathy to one another, that I was observing that innovation in one place didn't look like innovation in another. And that's when we decided to start Global Connect for two reasons. One, it was a way for us to make money to support the local Connect program. But it was also, too, a way for us to learn and test our hypotheses about innovation. That innovation, and this was the premier hypothesis, had more to do with behavior and culture than it did with process and four walls and a building. And so, but we had to prove that. Now, I mentioned to you before that I was kind of a bit of a reluctant entrepreneur. I also happen to be a very stubborn entrepreneur. I'm the kind of entrepreneur that gets egged on when someone tells me I can't do something or that I'm wrong, and that yet I feel it's right. So that was what really kind of spurred us on with Global Connect. We were out there to prove that these models of what we thought were happening and we felt in our hearts were actually the way uh, things were going on. I then went around to kind of key thought leaders in the space around innovation, including folks like Clay Christensen at Harvard and even Mary Walshock here at UCSD, and said, you can hardly pick up a business book or watch a talk about business today that doesn't have the word innovation in it. And if you have been studying and writing about innovation for, for so many years, for 20 plus years, and there's so much known about innovation according to these books, why does it still seem to be so elusive? Why do so few people really are able to harness it and make it happen? Uh, and why is it that once even we know what to do, we just fail to implement those very lessons that we have learned? 
And it wasn't until actually I read a book from two professors at Stanford University that a colleague of mine gave me by Pfeffer and Sutton called The Knowing Doing Gap. And it says, well, knowing what to do and doing something are two very, very different things. And it's kind of like a circuit that knowing what to do exists up here, doing something exists right here, but in between, in order to complete the circuit, everything goes through right here. There's a connection that happens. And very often, it gets stuck right here. Intellectually, we know we should do something. We should know we should get more sleep. We should exercise more. We shouldn't eat that extra helping of dessert. And yet, we do it because it feels good in the moment to do it. And we're basically emotional beings. And we're there to optimize our own well-being. So then that led me on a journey to uh, try to figure out why exactly innovation happens and how you might use design thinking to actually design better innovation practices and how to do it. And the one lesson we learned very early on, and this is the lesson for you, is you cannot make innovation happen. The best you're able going to do is increase the chances that it happens. It is no longer a model of probability and deterministic value. It's a model of possibility and plausibility to what you're doing. And once I kind of gathered that and felt that, I was then able to kind of go forward. So basically, all economic activity in our lives actually started here in our villages, um, where we related to one another. And it was when we were able to take our combined knowledge around, in this case, agrarian practices and farming, that we were then able to apply those practices to the collective good as a society. And then, of course, those same models became quite important as we learned to domesticate cattle and eventually harness the natural and physical resources around us. So then it led to what we call uh, um, the nature of the firm, or why corporations exist. A very seminal paper written by Ronald Coase, uh, University of Chicago, all around why firms exist and why people go to cities. And the reason was very simple, is because when you have scarce resources and you collect them all in one place, you tend to waste fewer numbers of resources. That there's an efficiency gain by people working collectively and together to drive mutual benefit across a, a, a wide array of opportunities. And so historically, we've always looked at economics like this. There's a set of inputs, we add value to them, and we get, hopefully, a value-added output. And over the years, the ingredients have remained exactly the same. What you will now see is that the recipe, though, has changed. And I was talking about this with uh, uh, Steve earlier, is that very often we try to think we can predict the future, but very often we fail more than we don't. Hence the surprise that a lot of people had last night with the elections, and then the market's trying to figure out what happened after the fact. Now, human beings are quite uh, interesting and unique in that they have the ability, we have the ability to think about the future. We can create prospective memories, and then we can model and change our behavior in the present to manifest something that has not yet happened. So it's part of what drives us when we buy a lottery ticket. We buy a lottery ticket, and all of a sudden our mind begins creating all these wonderful images of what we're going to do when we win the lottery. Buying that car, quitting our job, buying a new house. And for some reason, you can get a physiological response in the present that very closely mimics that of what actually happens or close to what would happen if we actually won it. It makes us feel good about it. It inspires us. It motivates us. It moves us forward. And it's one of those things that has allowed us to do something different tomorrow than we did today just because we want to, because out of pure desire for doing it. The other thing is that we have the ability to specialize. So I'm very fortunate that I don't have to sew my own clothes or grow my own food. I can go to the market and we can exchange currency in that. So the fact that we can specialize and then trade those specialties um, is really important. And the fact is then we create markets in which to trade those specialties. Those ingredients have, what, have really what allowed us to be economically productive and that is of course the nature uh, of cities. People then move to city centers because that's where the greatest industrial resources were. Those were where the resources, uh, because that's where the resources were, that's where the jobs were created. So the old model was people went to where the jobs were. And back in my parents' generation, they didn't choose a job based on, gee, is it going to be exciting and relevant? It's going to be, can it provide me stability, a paycheck, and an ability to provide for my family? Um, so, but what we've seen over the last 20 years is that the rules of engagement have changed. And I told you about this white paper we wrote, and what we were seeing is that the internet was democratizing access to information that we were having these tools that were changing the asymmetric advantage 
that we used to have. So corporate and competitive advantage and regional advantage historically had been around the asymmet asymmetry of resources. Again, the reason you went to the city centers is because that's where the resources were. The people, the reason uh, bank robbers rob banks is because that's where the money was. And that could be arbitraged in a market. So when we worked at Berkshire Hathaway, part of our economic or our business advantage was that we had knowledge that others didn't. And we could trade that knowledge in the market. Uh, but the internet was democratizing access to information, talent was becoming mobile, and capital was becoming a global commodity, that we were creating methods for moving capital around. And so now what we were seeing was a reversal, and Richard Florida writes about this in his book, The Rise of the Creative Class. The jobs were now going to where the creative people were, around centers of high, uh, intellectual thinking and creativity, and so it was no accident that the jobs were then create, getting created in places like Silicon Valley, Boston, and other places. And so then we had to kind of rethink what it meant to be a city, or in this case, a community uh, around them. So we came up, and what the, uh, my first book was really centered around was uh, rethinking what the different processes were at play. And the first model is exactly what we were talking about, this rise of the industrial and agrarian economies that had provided benefit for us for the last couple of centuries. And these are models of production economies, but they were also models based on mindsets of scarcity. That we had limited resources and we had to figure out how to optimize the use of those resources. And so we tended to build models that were linear in nature. Because the linearity, first of all, was highly transparent and gave us a clue as to what the outcome we were seeking was. And so it's no accident that we plant our crops in a very linear way because when then we run the irrigation hoses down them, it's the most efficient way and we waste the fewest number of resources. So a lot of our knowledge is actually put into the engineering of process to optimize uh, uh, the economic value. And we see the same thing produced over and over again, whether it's the way we produced uh, automobiles in the early 1900s or even the military industrial complex but it even goes to the way we manufacture chips and other things today. It's very much a continuous model of production. And the kinds of people we hired and trained are people who didn't make mistakes. So our universities and schools were very focused on producing experts. And that's who we prize and that's who we value. But we saw another model at play as well. And we wanted to contrast that model of what we were actually observing. And this was a model for creative systems, of knowledge systems throughout. And instead of built on mindsets of scarcity, these were actually systems built on mindsets of abundance. And to give you a clue is that if you and I get together for coffee and you have an idea for a new startup you want uh, to start, and you share that idea with me, and then I give you back an idea, we now each have two ideas. And if we keep going on with that, and then we also include more and more people, we actually generate a near infinite capacity for knowledge and ideas in the system. So rather than taking the system down to zero, you actually increase it to uh, near infinity. And it was when I read a book by Matt Ridley called The Rational Optimist that a lot of this became clear because he said, innovation is really all about ideas having sex. And that was kind of an epiphany for me because I just realized that my job uh, was to promote promiscuity, to try to get these ideas together, which is the reason we build incubators and accelerators. The reason we have pro programs like the Design Lab is because we're really trying to create these collisions of ideas. And very often, instead of engineering process, really what we're trying to do is engineer serendipity in a lot of ways. And we call these models rainforests, which is why, the, hence the name of the book. And in a rainforest, you look at this picture and you can see it's lush and dense, has a lot of biodiversity, but it's not like the plantation we saw in the first one or the vineyard because you don't know what the key product in this is. You don't know who the winner is in this system. In fact, do you know what the most important thing in this picture is? It's probably the weeds that you're standing on. The weeds are these things that look odd and actually don't look like they belong there. In fact, they look like things you're going to pull out. And in fact, in the vineyard model, you do pull out the weeds because they compete for the very resources you're trying to optimize and preserve. But here, these are the Facebooks, uh, uh, the Googles of the world. And not only do these things look odd and out of place when you first see them, the people who run these businesses look odd and out of place when you do them. 
And there's a wonderful movie, if you get a chance to watch it, called Something Ventured. And it's a history of the Silicon Valley and the companies of the Silicon Valley, but told through the eyes of the VCs and entrepreneurs uh, in the business. And there's one particular case study that I think you'd enjoy, which is the story of Apple. And so it's, it's the story of Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak having this idea and trying to find someone who would, who would listen to their idea. So Mike Markala, who had had a lot of success, had retired at the age of the ripe old age of 32, uh, was asked to meet with these guys, and he really liked what he heard. But he said, these are two people that don't look like success. Unkempt, a bit arrogant, edgy, they dress differently than other people. He said Steve Jobs smelled really bad. And we have these patterns of what we think success looks like and then some people come in the room and they don't fit those models of success, at least those patterns of it. And yet someone is seeing something in them. He heard the story of what they were saying and Mike Merkel said, wow, this could be a really big business. This could be a huge opportunity. We could create a Fortune 500 company in five years out of this. And then he presented to people like Arthur Rock and others who had backed him in his first. And Mike Merkle said, trust me, this is interesting. And they said, you know, we think you're right. But this happens over and over again. Uh, for and, and so in the first model, remember we said we hire people who are experts and don't make mistakes? What we like to hire in these rainforests are people who are really good problem solvers, people who are creative. Because a lot of what lies in the future is not about what's on the map, it's what's off the edges of the map. In fact, if you look at a Borgia map, which is one of the maps of the 1400s, and you look at the edges of these old world maps, there was a Latin uh, inscription on the edges of the map that said, Hic Centriconus, here be dragons. And it implied that if you went anywhere off the known world, you would either fall off or be eaten by dragons. Therefore, stay where you know. So the kinds of skills we give our students and our entrepreneurs is how to you read maps. I say that the best school, skills we can give entrepreneurs today is how to use a compass because all the interesting stuff happens at the edges and off the edges of these maps. And so rather than teach people merely how to navigate, teach them how to orienteer themselves around that. And as Edison said, it's not that he's uh, actually failed, he's just found lots of ways not to do something as he moves forward. Um, and so what we learn is that imagination is actually more important than knowledge. Knowledge is confined to the world that is known and it will help you incrementally improve what you already do, but imagination is what allows us to do that which we didn't know. In fact, at Stanford University, so uh, Steve mentioned that I'm a research fellow at the uh, Center for Design Research there. And Larry Leifer, who runs the uh, CDR there, says, you know, design thinking is all about teaching empathy. And he said, and, and he says, you know, well, so who do we teach empathy to? He says, we teach empathy to bad people. And he says, well, who are the bad people? He says, people like you. And he's pointing to me. I said, why me? He said, because you're the one who breaks the rules and does things without asking permission. And so those are the people who need to learn how to connect to others. The people who want to go out and see a different world, want to change it, and don't necessarily want to ask permission, but they need to have empathy for the other person. And so it's just a kind of a different model um, uh, to think about. Now this is a, one from our colleague, uh, Dave Snowden who works in the area of complexity theory. But he sees the world really in kind of four distinct realms. Uh, this is what you call the simple realm, where things are very transparent and easy. It's where we like to be. It's where we're most comfortable because we're at peace with ourselves and at equilibrium. Here is the complicated world. This is where we've existed for a long time or where we're, where we're fine, which is where there are things we want to explore, but it's where we seek cause and effect relationships. If we only do X, then Y is most likely to happen. These are models of probability and, and uh, deterministic outcomes. This is where I spend a lot of my time. And this is where a lot of our ecosystem design work spends, is in the area of complexity. It's not about probability, it's all around possibility and plausibility. Instead of governing constraints that write us, it's all about enabling constraints. The tools of innovation are only things that actually help us achieve something, they're not the ends themselves. Technology are only tools to enable us to do things differently as we go forward. 
And therefore, we try to make sense of the world of how we go. Now, we're also trying to be, we also need to move beyond systems of, it used to be think, or we used to think that the best way to build a strong company or a strong business was to build a big moat around it, like a castle. The bigger the moat and the stronger our walls, the more protected our company, our, our business was. The thing is, the minute those walls were breached, we had a problem. So then we decided that the best way to respond was we had to build systems where we could respond appropriately. So when someone knocked a hole in our wall, we had people who knew how to fix the walls. and We could go in. And then the next evolution, which is where we're at right now, is this concept of resilience. How do we build resilience into our communities, into our systems? And resilience meant that, that uh, we respond as quickly as possible, that we have uh, uh, intelligence that tells us when things are about to happen, and then once it happens, we're able to respond. And the future of this, though, is really in what uh, Taleb called building an anti-fragile system. And the best way to think of anti-fragile systems is if you look at superheroes, those ones that get hit with a bolt of energy, and rather than just recovering and healing, they actually become stronger or bigger, and they actually take that energy and now incorporate that in what they're doing, and they throw it back. That all these little experiments we do in our cities, it's not that we succeed in spite of those, it's we succeed precisely because of those. Because each of those new bolts of energy we take are lessons to learn. And so we have to encourage our cities and our environments and our corporations to take lot or do lots of experiments because that's what provides the fuel for what we're doing. So our systems are traditional stability as we move this way and agility. Uh, helps us go that way. And this is what it looks like. And so one of the things that's interesting about working in places like the Silicon Valley or even San Diego is you have economies and companies that reinvent themselves before there's any external stimulus to do so. Usually we only change once someone forces us or pushes us uh, uh, towards a change. But not in this case. We actually change just because we're curious and because we're, we're bored with the status quo. True necessity is the mother of invention, but I also believe laziness is as well. Um, and so you can see how the different systems uh, uh, work across there. So herein lies the paradox of innovation, is that innovation is truly only measured once it is imitated, adopted, and diffused. So it's always a retrospective measurement. So the things we do in our laboratories, in our design labs, they may be inventive, they may be creative, they may even be novel. But they're not innovative because innovation is determined by the market and society. By their use and adoption and diffusion of these things, they determine what is truly innovative. And the paradox, because of that paradox, we always try to prospectively determine what is innovative and how to make innovation happen. And yet, when you talk to the experts of the time, we always get it wrong. If you go to the current experts at any moment in time and you ask them, is this innovative, chances are they will get it wrong because chances are the innovation you're presenting represents a disruption or a change to what they're already doing. All innovation babies are born ugly. It's just a fact. And over and over again, we see the same theme being played out. So that is why uh, in order for innovation to happen, you have to think big and you have to think beyond. So this is what I was saying before, that knowledge is more important, uh, I'm sorry, uh, imagination is more important than knowledge. And we even see that not only do we have to design new systems for how we design the environments for innovation, we have to actually design new leadership and human capability models. So in traditional leadership models, we build what we call egocentric models or ecosystem models. And they're very much models of command and control, where the person at the top deigns to push resources down based on permission and status. It's also assumed that it's also the best allocation of scarce resources. So in production economies, this is definitely a great way to allocate resources. But ecosystem models produce the most innovation outcomes because everyone plays an equal and important role in an ecosystem model, it's a matter of timing rather than title. And I guess the best way to illustrate that is when you go to a play, actors come and hit their marks and speak their lines, and the person who's speaking their line and on their mark at that moment 
is the most important person in the play. Yes, there are people who have more important roles or bigger names, uh, but that person is the most important person. So we all play an equal and important role. It's more our, our, ti our timing rather than our title. The other thing uh, that we're doing in a lot of our current design work is understanding that communities and corporations are really a combination of hardware and software. We often focus or overfocus on the hardware aspect, the actual physical structures and processes of we put into place to make innovation happen. But all innovation is human centric. And because of that, the human capabilities of how we actually interact with one another are not only equally as important, but they're actually more important towards uh, the idea of driving innovation. So how we create a human OS operating system to drive innovation. So if you want to create more innovation, the best way is not to think like an economist, but to actually think more like a psychologist. Because what we've learned and what uh, Maya Angelou told us is long after people remember what you say or do, they're going to remember how you made them feel. And that's what's really important. Now, two conditions that are uh, really important if you do want to make more innovation happen and you want to build these kinds of innovation systems, you have to be prepared for ambiguity and discomfort. Because it's only when we're uncomfortable and when things are not clear that we actually get up out of our chairs and seek answers to those. When everything is right in front of us and, and clear, we tend to accept it for what it is. And of course, along the ways, do not be afraid to disrupt. Because the amount of impact you're able to generate is directly proportional to the number of people you will probably piss off along the way. The other condition in order to make innovation happen is bring people together who are uninformed and intelligent. If you only bring experts together to help you do something, the best you're going to do is get incremental thinking on what they're already doing. Uh, so diversity and uh, diversity of opinions and experiences are really what drive a lot of our, our, our work. And of course, don't be afraid to fail. Now, a lot of emphasis, in fact overemphasis, has been put on the concept of failure and how we need to create systems uh, that encourage failure. Trust me, failure is never the goal of what you're trying to do. Failure is a natural byproduct of experimentation and reaching or going beyond the map. Failure is useful only if the lessons learned from it can then be applied to do something better, the redemption uh, of what we're doing. And so we can't be afraid to fail. Now here's the model where we need to move beyond, uh, which is, in, as I mentioned at Berkshire Hathaway, we were very much predicting and repeating, doing the same thing over and over again and <coughs> optimizing what we are doing. And that was considered success. But in these models of innovations, it's all about learning, adapting, and evolving uh, uh, rapidly. Uh, planning, versus mo uh, planning versus modeling. Historically, we'd ask students to write business plans. The only thing I know about your business plan is that it's wrong. And the only use for it after you've written it is as a doorstop. That said, the exercise of putting business plans can be useful because it forces you to sit down and think through a lot of those things. But we prefer uh, going through business models, highly flexible, adaptive things that as you learn, you change your assumptions or you validate them, and you then put new lessons in there as well. Um, inventing versus innovating we talked about. But these last two are the important ones, which is moving away from institution-centric thinking to individual centric thinking. So I'm doing a lot of work now for uh, in the development bank world, did some projects for the World Bank and the Inter-American Development Bank on what does the next generation of banking look like? And also how do we use design thinking for designing entirely new governance and government systems, including how do we uh, use design thinking for policy uh, uh, practice? And then the last one is the orthodoxy versus the orthopraxy. Um, Orthodoxy is do as I say, orthopraxy is do as I do. Um, and what we find as entrepreneurs, we tend to follow and respect those people who actually practice what they say as opposed to merely just uh, write books about what they say. So in this case, uh, this has to do with uh, creating smarter and more intelligent cities, is that we have no problem setting up incubators which incubate technologies and ideas. We should be incubating people exactly the same way. 
We're also seeing that there are new models of leadership required, both from a civic perspective, but also from a corporate uh, uh, societal perspective. Um, that a lot of these leaders who run these very high impact, high growth companies lead through the power of their vision and the ability to create a, a, a compelling future for people. And we understand exactly what our role in that future is and how we can change the world and give us purpose. And so the kinds of skills that we need to give these leaders are different than the skills of traditional leadership and management uh, that we've been focusing on. So one of the interviews I did for the next book coming out, which is called The Religion of Innovation, was with a very successful um, angel investor in the Silicon Valley who has managed to spot uh, excellence in companies long before the market realized that. So companies like Facebook, PayPal, Twitter, Google, where he was one of the initial investors in there before the VCs got in. And I said, if you could take all the knowledge you have today and go back to the beginning, what might you do differently? And he said, I would never fire or allow to be fired a product visionary CEO, even if they weren't a great CEO. He said, it's just a fact that it's easier and uh, that we produce more Sheryl Sandbergs, who's the COO of Facebook, than we produce Mark Zuckerbergs these visionaries who see the future in a very different way. And so we need to rethink these titles of people who lead organizations. That uh, I don't think anyone's under the illusion that on a daily basis Mark Zuckerberg runs Facebook, but he leads the organization. And very often we have to think about how we create new leaders who can lead these kind of companies. Um, we also need to create new policy frameworks and uh, enlighten legislators. So for one of the projects we're doing in Singapore, we're, we're going to be focusing on blockchain acceleration. So designing new solutions for banking, uh, um, land registry, smart contracts using the blockchain. But although it'll have a traditional technology incubator, on the floor just above it, we're going to have a policy incubator, what we're calling a regulatory sandbox. And what we're going to do is we're going to have the regulatory and policy people work directly with uh, the technology folks, because we want to understand the impact that, techno that policies and, and legislation have on the adoption and diffusion of new technologies. And we want to incubate that exactly the same way we incubate new technologies and to play against one another. We're also going to be creating um, new social systems where the floor above that is going to bring together behavioral economists, social anthropologists, psychologists, cognitive scientists, uh, to understand what are the behavioral aspects uh, of the introduction of new technologies and how do those change how we actually design and create new solutions for the market. How does that interact with the policy? And then of course the floor above that's going to focus on this next generation of human leadership or this uh, uh, human centric leadership uh, for these companies. In addition, we also have to train media and journalists better. They're the ones who story tells. And the one thing that is the most important skill of any entrepreneur is the ability to tell a compelling story. You can hire people to do spreadsheets. You can hire people to do uh, product design. But if you can't tell a compelling story about a future and you can't get people excited about that future, you won't have a business to get funded. Uh, and so we have to work with media and journalists. And so we actually uh, had created a program, not just for media and journalists, but also for entrepreneurs that we worked on with Pixar, using the Pixar methodology, how to tell, be better at storytelling. Um, this is the program that we're working with some of the development banks, which is the first wave of development banks. And for those of you who don't know much about them, groups like the World Bank or the Inter-American Development Bank, they, they were established post-World War II to lend money to countries to rebuild infrastructure, roads and highways, because they believed commerce was the vital lifeblood of an economy. And so after you built all these roads and highways, then the next generation of development banking was around how do we lend to build secondary infrastructure, things like universities and hospitals, eventually incubators and, and other types of schools. Well, the third wave of, of infrastructure development is social infrastructure the connective tissue, kind of the nerves that pass information fast and accurately and calibrated to one another. And this can be everything from how we make broadband accessible to people to actually how we use these new tools of social engagement uh, to drive it. So we're working on how we actually create a model 
at government levels to actually improve the access to these new social because access to broadband and these tools is becoming a human right rather than just a privilege uh, uh, of it. So we're using design thinking around that. Uh, and so that's really kind of where our work is, is taking us. And while we talk a lot about rainforest and creating these systems that are highly flexible and adaptive, you actually need both sides of the equation to make things work. It's the pulse between the production side pushing back on the innovators and creators and the creators pushing equally back on the status quo that creates all the innovation. And it's figuring out what that right pulse is that's going to make more and more innovation happen and increase the chances that it happens. Uh, thank you. <laughs>